Last season, we saw the Flying Husky racing drivers put their mark on some of the greatest circuits across the world. Now for this new season, the league is back and ready to provide the same level of excitement and commitment we've come to expect from them. And you'll see it all here live on the Global Sim Racing Channel. Hi, I'm DJ Clark and with me in the booth is Reese Gardner. Behind the scenes is our director, Sean Ambrose, and he's using cameras provided by Drug Dougie Beard. First up on the schedule for these Flying Huskies is the Red Bull Ring. The circuit is a new addition to the iRacing service, so let's hop over to the track guide to learn more. Welcome to the Red Bull Ring. Located near Spielberg, Austria, this track began life in a much more fast and sweeping format. Having gone through multiple different owners, it eventually was snatched up by Red Bull and has its three different layouts you see today. While they range roughly between one to two and a half miles in length, the thing they hold in common are fast straights, hard braking zones, and very few corners. 
In fact, the longest and most common layout, the Grand Prix course, has only nine of them. Spots like Rebus and Gosser are the most popular corners for overtakes, but both involve dramatic elevation changes. Each have their perils. Remus tends to see drivers make contact when the blind cutback often goes wrong. Whereas Gosser tempts you into braking far too late and the downhill nature shoots cars miserably into the gravel. A few swift bends still scatter the track, with turns like Lauda, Rent, or A1 really testing a driver's accuracy at high speeds. However, most of them don't send you off into the grass. Rather, there is a lot of paved runoff. But they often include some nasty curves most cars will want to avoid hitting, as they've been known to damage suspension and undertrays. A variety of types of racing compete here, with everything from lower Formula open wheelers to motorcycles, touring cars, and all the way up to Formula One holding events regularly. Set among the gorgeously picturesque Alps and including great racing on a challenging and history-rich circuit, it's easy to see why fans and drivers are both eager every time they come for a race. Well, Reese, open wheelers like this should feel right at home at the Red Bull ring. How do you think these flying Husky drivers are going to handle out here today? I think they're going to handle it pretty well. I mean, this track is uh, fairly simple at the Red Bull ring. Only nine turns uh, on the iRacing service by those corner standards, at least, and uh, certainly provides fantastic racing with its heavy braking zones and two big hairpins in the uh, the second sector there to really test the drivers. You've also got those sweepers in the middle of the lap that uh, will really bring the downforce into the equation. But you've got to be careful about the lines you take, especially on the exits of some of these corners. This track uses iRacing's new four-tire off-track detection system, which means in the final sector, you can really use a lot of the curbs, but you put a wheel over the line just a little bit and you get that off track, your lap will be invalidated. Indeed. Well, before we get to those laps out on track, we want to bring your attention to some of the sponsors of tonight's event. First being Norsled. Norsled is a nonprofit animal welfare organization dedicated to rescuing, rehabilitating, and finding homes for unwanted, abandoned, and abused Husky dogs. Today, every flying Husky racing track day or car event benefits Norsled, uh, with a portion of the proceeds being donated to them. Even if you can't adopt, you can still help and ensure care for these amazing animals through your support. Save a Husky. For more information, contact Todd Curtis through email at todd at flyinghusky.racing. Today's event is also brought to you by Flying Husky Racing. Flying Husky Racing is a car club based in the Pacific Northwest that delivers premium track days and car events for automotive enthusiasts. FHR is dedicated to safety, development, and build a community among members and participants. Find out more on the web at flyinghusky.racing. Flying Husky Racing, track days are the best days. Well, speaking of that on track action, let's bring your attention to today's race details. Drivers are currently wrapping up their qualifying session right now. We are driving those Dallara F3 machines. And after that qualifying session is over, we'll be in for a 25 minute race here for the Fudgy the Whale season three kickoff race. It is going to be a good one and a fast repair is available. So we will have to keep an eye for that. Yeah, absolutely, we will. Big passing zones at turns 9, 10, turn 3. And um, not much downforce that these Dallara F3s are producing compared to their Grand Prix counterparts that usually race at this racetrack. But the draft is going to be mega at this place. Those very long straights, the run out of turn one. If you can nail the exit, you can certainly get a great draft on the car in front. Andrew Hardman here. Currently second, and I don't know if that lap has ended up counting. Uh, at the very least, it's not as quick as the fastest lap. He set a 25.561 as the checkered flag is about to fly here in qualifying. Currently, it's Michael Broomhead on pole position, a 25.306. So two tenths ahead of his rival, Andrew Hardman. They were pretty close in practice, though. So I expect them to really duke it out with each other for the lead in this race. Looks like uh, Hans Salnave not able to improve there on his sixth place. But we got an eight-car turnout here for the first round of the season, DJ, and here's the stunning grid. 
lead starting off on pole as you said it's michael broomhead followed by andrew hardman with james doherty and todd curtis rounding out your top half of the field dean hawks is going to line up in fifth alongside hans salnave and dan garber and harland gulborn taking up the final two spots on the grid garber and gulborn did not set qualifying times so we don't have much of, uh, of a look into their pace at the moment but we'll see what happens once the drivers get off the line michael broomhead taking up his pole position starting place there and you've got to be careful in these cars. It's a four-cylinder engine in these Delara F3s with the intake off to the side. You see that rocket launcher on driver's left on that side of the airbox. So it's a bit of a challenge to put the power down here in the lower gears. Let's see who gets the best launch. Just waiting here for Dan Garber to ready to the grid. That's a great point there, Reese waiting away as we've said clock ticking down here getting very close to going this is uh, a bit unique for gsrc we don't see a whole lot of standing starts here but it always does provide a little bit of a special run still waiting for garber i haven't seen any connection issues from him quite yet so he may just be putting some final tweaks into the car uh as we go no pit stops in this race this is a true sprint race here only 25 minutes yeah so it looks like we'll probably expect about 18 laps or thereabouts from these drivers with the one minute 30 lap times just waiting and waiting as the timer goes to zero looks like we're not going to see dan garber on the grid but let's see who gets away from the line dj Ooh, a little bit of a start there, for, potentially from Han Solne, but there are the lights ready to go, and it is green flag here at the Red Bull ring. That's an amazing start for James Doherty, starting to poke his nose up into the inside. Not the best getaway there from Broomhead. Hardman able to get ahead at the line. Doherty able to nose his way forward. They start to charge up the hill. Doherty and Broomhead side by side. Excellent stuff there for second place. Hardman is starting to bring out one heck of a gap on these guys as to the inside goes Michael Broomhead going to go for the move here at the turn three hairpin. This is a very challenging corner to get right. You've got to be careful of the traction on the exit on these cold tires, but it looks like Broomhead got the move done. Now he can focus on chasing down Andrew Hardman to try and get that lead back. But have a look at the draft from James Doherty. He's going to try and get Broomhead back here at the other hairpin. Looks like it's not going to happen for the time being. Yeah, Broom had a little bit cagey there and able to put the car defensively to get around him. Doherty losing a lot of time behind him. Todd Curtis there had a little bit of a problem going into that first or the second corner uh, as it looks like Harlan Goldborn has been off in the back. We don't need to go to it. We can keep focused here, riding on board with Todd Curtis right now. Yeah, showing how much of the curb you can use towards the end of the lap here and the very challenging final two turns here at the Red Bull ring. you really got to tip it in hard and try to avoid using too much of that curb on the inside, but you can run it all the way over the green and white curbs there on at the exit, just trying to maximize it as best he can as our series organizer, Todd Curtis. He is sort of within draft range of James Doherty there, so we'll see if he can catch up to the battle for second, but as the first lap is completed. Looks like Andrew Hardman leading by 1.2 seconds there over Michael Broomhead. And the field getting a little bit spaced out now, but if they can nail their exits, nail their braking zones, they'll certainly close up to each other in the draft. They certainly will. Great camera angle there from our camera guru, Dougie Beard. As you can see, just the speed these cars take through that sweeping right-handed corner. The heavy braking zone now plunging back this undulating straightaway here. Doherty losing a little bit of ground to Michael Broomhead, focusing here on our leader, though, Andrew Hardman. Now, we have seen many, many times that the leader in this race and these, uh, these Flying Husky races can make a mistake, and that can cause everything to get thrown up into the air. Indeed, uh, it looks like Gene Hawks we're focusing on at the moment. He's oh, running a little bit wide there in the middle of the circuit. Uh, Todd Curtis and James Doherty still continuing on as per usual. But let's see then 
how the gaps look and who sets the fastest first flying lap here of course lap one a bit slower because of the standing start but we'll get a bit of an eye in as to who is the quicker driver out on track hardman crosses the line a 26 8 michael broomhead crosses the line a 26 5 so the lead might be on soon it may indeed, and Broomhead's been able to get that gap down to about a second. We ride on board here. You can see that speed comparison now as they start to pick up speed near the end of it. Broomhead getting a little bit of the advantage of the draft if he's able to close in. Let's stay here and watch this heavy braking zone. Brings it around. Good clip of the curb there for Broomhead. And interesting to note there, Reese, that I would say he's keeping it in, in fifth gear. He clearly thinks that he's going to have a lot of speed to pick up when he gets a little bit closer in that draft. Yeah, absolutely. Just snatching sixth gear on the run up to the braking zone for this hairpin here, which is very challenging to slow down for. Got to brake a little bit earlier than you think because um, the corner comes up a little quicker than you expect. But you can really carry a lot of speed into this left hander here. Just try and turn it in early run out wide over the curb and then once again tip it in in fourth gear you can suffer a little bit of understeer through that left hander but it looks like broomhead isn't suffering any such issue and you can see the gap just getting ever so closer between he and andrew hardman hardman just running a little bit wide of the curb and all very wide for michael broomhead between turns nine and ten yeah, both of them will more than likely have picked up an incident for that. Broomhead able to get the gap down to about seven tenths of a second now as they cross over the line. Hardman setting a fast lap there with a 26-4, but Broomhead setting a 26-1, but that did not count courtesy of that track limit violation. But let's keep it here. Broomhead has now got the gap down to about five tenths of a second. He's not going to be able to make the move here going into turn three, but if he can get the run here, Reese, he may have something. Yeah, certainly. You can already see that he's going into the hairpin a lot harder than Andrew Harbin is. He's carrying more speed up to the apex. So that is allowing him to stay within that crucial draft range. And I find it interesting that uh, these drivers are running all the way to the apex at that hairpin. Uh, in a lot of racing series, you'll often see drivers running a little bit wide of the apex at turn three. It's uh, a little bit flatter in the mid track. You can square off the car a bit better and get a better run down the straight. But these guys obviously uh, very comfortable with going all the way to that inside curb and oh, a little bit of dirty air already starting to affect Michael Broomhead. I saw him run a bit wide through the turn before this and um, he's going to have to wait once again for the straight to try and make a move here on Hardman. But again, he's, oh, he got a little crossed up on the run into uh, turn nine there and uh, that sent him wide again. So he's picked up another incident and uh, it seems he's having a couple of issues getting right up close to Andrew Hardman. Yeah, that dirty air clearly affecting him there. And important to know that there is not an incident limit here, so he's not going to run afoul of anything. Looks like he tiptoed onto that sausage curb onto the outside, so that may hurt him. Now as they continue to come up the hill, Broomhead close enough to be able to get a speed advantage here over Hardman, but again, not close enough. Reese, as you said, both drivers coming in, hugging that inside apex. Broomhead able to carry more speed into the corner. It looks like he's got the gap back down again to half a second. They they come back down this undulating straightaway. I don't think he's going to be close enough to be able to close it in here. And maybe he'll have some moves to be able to counter that dirty air as they go into the infield section. A little bit of a lockup from Andrew Hardman as well. So he's starting to really push that number 11 quite hard. Now this is the section where Broomhead started to have his issues. He's going a little bit softer into the left handers, which means he benefits a bit on the exit. But yeah, you can see that uh, I think that's just where Broomhead has a bit of a bit of a disadvantage uh, relative to Andrew Hardman in that middle sector of the lap. He just can't stay in touch with him. It's more in the first and second parts of the lap down those straights through the hairpins where he really has the advantage. Both of them look like they're keeping it within track limits this time. So all well and good. We'll get a proper reading here for Michael Broomhead's pace, a 25.801 for Michael and a 25. 5810 for Andrew Hardman. This is incredibly competitive here for the lead. 
It is indeed. And I have to say, I'm wondering if there may be a little bit of setup tweaking going on there for Broomhead. He may be running a little bit more trimmed down, and that's what's not allowing him to catch up nearly as much through that middle sector. Riding on board in the roll hoop, you can see just how much Broomhead is able to close up. Get it there. Gap still holding at about five tenths of a second, maybe a little bit under there. This is closer than we've seen him, but I don't think this is going to be close enough to be able to 